<laughs> Ladies, gentlemen, this is the well. this is the <laughs> European history lecture for Thursday, the fifth of May, two thousand twenty-two. We left things off during uh, the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. Frente Popular, the Popular Front, is uh, composed of centrist liberal parties like the CEDA, <clears throat> the Communists. The anarcho-syndicalists, who basically are communitarians like the communists, but they believe in localized control and voting among the locals. Um, and as the war develops, international brigades uh, composed of communists and their fellow travelers, including Americans who comprise the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Uh, who are fighting fascist? See, in the 1930s, Antifa wasn't a bunch of punks wearing masks in Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington, throwing bricks through buildings and being protected uh, by friendly local governments. You actually had to go into battle. I would have more respect for today's Antifa if they did that. Uh, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Nacional, uh, the National Front is composed of conservative liberal politicians, um, as well as the Carlists, who are fundamentalist Catholics who want to return to a medieval Spanish theocracy, uh, the Falangists, who are the Spanish fascists, led by Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera, who uh, is a left-wing fascist, who genuinely believes that uh, phalangism, Spanish fascism, will bring the people of Spain close together and give them a common purpose that will awake them, awaken them from the torpor that they've really felt since the uh, defeat of the Spanish Armada. As well as uh, other traditional elements in society. Now, the Spark event is the 1936 election which elects Frente Popular, the Popular Front government. But, for better or worse, instead of expecting, or instead of choosing to rule moderately, because their election victory was razor thin, Frente Popular chose to rule far, far, far to the left, with the intention of secularizing and socializing Spain as if they had won a landslide election mandate, which they did not. What they did is they took a country that was about 50-50 and they governed it like they had won 75% of the vote. This is unwise. In Chile, it resulted in a military coup and the suicide of President Allende because he governed as if he had had a mandate. He didn't. Uh, in other countries, it is, it is never a bad idea. When you have a country that's 50-50 and you suddenly govern like, no, it, it can provoke civil war or military uprisings or whatever. So uh, government's policies cause a conspiracy to develop, and the Spanish army works with certain elements within the Spanish navy to ship the elite Spanish military forces from the Spanish Sahara, which is now uh, Western Sahara, back to Spain under General, later Generalissimo Francisco Franco. So, the army lands and proclaims that uh, the nation must be saved from communism. The Popular Front says, that loyal or uh, loyal forces, they call themselves loyalists, loyal forces within Spain's government, army, navy, and population must rise up and defend the republic uh, against a uh, military uh, coup. And this initiates a <clears throat> three-year civil war. And like all civil wars, it is nasty, it is bloody, uh, you have war crimes on both sides. It becomes also very clearly a proxy war between the left extreme communism, 
socialists, <clears throat> and the right fascist or national socialists. Soon, the Republic is receiving overt military aid. Well, actually, we'll, we'll, start, we'll start first. What does the League of Nations do? After all, it's the same year that Italy invades Abyssinia or Ethiopia. Uh, it's, it's the same year. Maybe the League of Nations, after screwing up and being useless, or worse than useless, in 1931 with the Japanese in Manchuria and uh, with the uh, Italians in Ethiopia, maybe they'll do something good with Spain. Yeah, let's let's try to let's try to let's try to keep it a local fight. Let's try to prevent people from from shipping in their foreign aid to one side or the other. In general, we like the Republic, but the British and the French set up BS sank. I'm sorry, they set up limited sanctions, and they even try setting up naval patrols to protect, prevent people from shipping in um, arms. However. The Soviets decide we are intervening, and they send everything from Soviet tanks to Polykarpov fighter planes uh, and uh, volunteers, including the NKVD, the Soviet secret police, into Republican areas to support uh, the Spanish left. Dolores Ibaruri, a Basque woman who becomes known as La Passionaria, uh, becomes the chief spokesman of the Republican Republican side of the of the Popular Front side, uh, the left, the communists, and she calls calls for Spain's people to rise up against their traditional oppressors and uh, gut them, quite literally, with a knife. Um, Meanwhile, <clears throat> Germany and Italy <clears throat> decide that they're going to support Franco and the Nationalists. And they begin sending in uh, planes from the newly uh, unveiled Luftwaffe and tanks and guns and experts, including SS men. So, this becomes a war <clears throat> between international communism on the one hand and international fascism or national socialism on the other hand, with the Western democracies and the moribund League of Nations going, ah, which, which is a scientific historical term. Ah. I'm going to look it up. But I'm not telling you how to spell it. Now, as General Mola one of Franco's generals, is marching towards, I think, Toledo, or maybe Madrid. It, 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 it's at some point in the war where a nationalist army is marching from the south up towards a city held by the Republicans. Uh, a reporter, I think from Britain or the United States, asks... How, how do you how do you propose to take this 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 fortified city? And the answer is, I have four columns outside the city, and in city inside the city there is a fifth column that will work for us. From that moment, the term fifth columnist refers to enemy agents in your group. Uh, in World War II, my grandfather worked the tugboats in New York Harbor. He, he was a college graduate. His parents insisted on him getting a degree in banking, and he hated working in banks, so he got a job as an engineer on a tugboat. That kept him out of the fight in World War II, though, because moving cargo across New York Harbor was a uh, definitely important national interest, so he was exempt from that. Um, but they had meetings on making sure that fifth columnists were not uh, taking too, we're not recording too much data uh, about how the harbor was uh, was was run, and we're not allowed to, or we're not going to be allowed to uh, sabotage anything. So there was real concern about traitors, and, and the tr the term for traitor is fifth columnist. It comes from this moment. Now, Salamanca is captured by General Capo de Año and the, uh, the Spanish Foreign Legion. And there's a big rally. It's going to be held. 
And uh, uh, Capo Diano, which with his typical directness, uh, shouts, uh, uh, Viva la Muerta, long live death. <laughs> History comes, you know, you need the courage to pull the trigger. <laughs> and then one of the, one of the supposedly uh, friendly guests, Miguel de Unamuno, who has been brought there by the army, uh, is given the lectern. And again, this is, the, this is the Spanish philosopher who cannot bring himself to believe in God, though he desperately, desperately wants to. And he makes a equivocal philosophical address, which isn't sufficiently enthusiastic for the long-lived death crowd. And he's found dead the next day. Uh, clearly, he was killed uh, by the nationalist forces. <laughs> then the Luftwaffe with nationalist uh, markings bombs a I think it's also a Basque city northern Spain called Guernica and uh, this is one of the first times that a civil population even though it was a village sized fairly small civil population was brought under modern aerial bombardment um, Pablo Picasso famously paints a massive canvas, bright light switch, please, which he entitles Guernica, and it is one of the seminal paintings of that time. Okay, so we've got a mother screaming for her dead child. We've got mother screaming, there's the dead child. We've got panicked cattle, including this bull. We've got dead bodies in pieces on the ground. We've got a panicked horse in a state of stark terror. Dead birds. Severed head flying through the air body parts and bits of tools in their hands. A jumble of human dross, human waste. Because the bombs took what God made and made them scattered, separate, dead bits. Picasso's Guernica, you agree with his politics or not, like please, is a um, truly great piece of propaganda. Because it's not like the Soviets with Republican colors didn't do the same damn thing to a bunch of pro-nationalist communities. The thing about war is it is the only time when people are allowed to be completely vicious to one another and they're rewarded for it. They're praised for it. You killed a whole bunch of people. Have a medal. And in the end, the Republicans lose, uh, surviving communists escape. Oh, it is during this period, two things that, that, that are important. It's during this period that George Orwell goes to Spain. And he goes as an anti-fascist fighter. He fights uh, in Catalonia in a brown corduroy uniform uh, because he is a convinced communist. And he writes a book about this when he returns called Homage to Catalonia, which there's a copy in this room. Orwell, because he's a free-thinking communist, encounters for the first time Stalin, Stalin's style of communism. And he ends up leaving Spain because the NKVD is hunting him to kill him. So this British communist 
becomes um, he he encounters a moment which causes him to question his assumption that what's going on in the Soviet Union bears any resemblance to his ideal, and it doesn't. He ultimately writes uh, Animal Farm, which is in 1984, which is his true uh, testament to totalitarian communism uh, in Russia, and he's not for it. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, you should, and you, you may if you're going to graduate from this school. Um, did you see uh, JP, Awaken with JP's new video about... Uh, I have not. I, I, I'm saving it. Uh, but yeah, I, I see he's holding 1984. <laughs> well, no, it, it, the government in the United States has no business engaging in deciding what is and is not disinformation. That's chilling, and the only governments that do that tend to be totalitarian. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're looking for truth, don't go to the government. Find some, find a guru, find a writer, <laughs> find a, find an epiphany. But really, going to <laughs> you, you'll decide this for yourself. Um, second thing. One of the only experiments in communitarianism, a la socialism, that actually works to an extent happens during the Spanish Civil War. In the mountains of the north, the, the fringes of the uh, Cantabrian Alps and the Pyrenees, there are several communities on the Republican side that are run by anarcho-syndicalists. And what these valleys do is they establish communes. Now, everything is shared within these communes. People start stop eating at home. Everyone eats in a common uh, cafeteria. Children are no longer to be raised by their parents. There's still a relationship, obviously, but children will be raised in common. The entire village will raise them. Um, everyone at some time does all the jobs in the community, cutting trees down, working in the fields, working in a factory, digging latrines, cleaning latrines, um, cooking food, hopefully not one than the other, and um, helping take care of the kids. And uh, most nights a week there's a meeting where the next day's work is decided and where things are voted on. Now, when I say it works, I mean it's one of the few types of genuine socialism that don't produce lots of dead people. And it's two reasons why this works. The other form of socialism that also works is the Israeli kibbutz. A kibbutz is a communal farm uh, in Israel where people go and they, they apply for membership. And if they get membership, they join up. And again, everything's held in common. You're assigned a, a place to live. Your children are going to be raised by the community along with you. Um, and you're going to be sharing in all the work and sharing in all the benefits. And it, 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 it also works. The thing that the anarcho-syndicalist communes in, in, in the Spanish Civil War and Israeli kibbutzim then and now have in common is twofold. First, they're small. Uh, in these communities, people know one another. So it's not impersonal. It's not bureaucratic. It's not top-down. The community comes together. People have their arguments. You learn who's for what, and you can basically predict what people are still are going to say. But you still let them have your, their say. There's a degree of trust built up among the people because you know it. You know one another. And the second thing is they're voluntary. If you want to leave the commune, you can. If you want to leave the kibbutz, you can. Nobody's forced to stay, and a number of people don't. In fact, uh, in Israel, there are people who spend some time in a kibbutz and then leave because it doesn't suit them. Um, a lot of others stay. So I, a dyed-in-the-wool anti-communist, anti-socialist conservative, am telling you that there are two cases where I have seen and recognized a form of socialism to actually work. But in both cases, they're small-scale, built on personal relationships, and they involve voting. And uh, they are voluntary. So bear that in mind. If you're curious about it, look more deeply into it. Um, it is worth studying. I am personally happy that Franco won the war. I think the bloodstained communists would have been a disaster for Spain. Franco was, though fairly disastrous for Spain, too. 
when you have a civil war this bloody, eh, whichever side wins, unless you are very, very fortunate in your leaders, uh, the country remains embittered for generations. And that's what happens in Spain. Uh, for example, the greatest monument to the Civil War is built by Franco. It's this giant concrete cross in what is called the Valley of the Fallen. And it is dedicated to the fighters on the nationalist side who fell in the Civil War. And this was built decades later. That should tell you something. If you're fighting a Civil War and the war ends and one side wins, one of the ways to bring healing is to have a monument built 20 years later to all of the fallen on both sides. Because that brings people together in grief. In grief. Franco didn't do that. Franco also, because he gained power with the help of Hitler and Mussolini, uh, was begged by them during World War II, please join us, join us, let us fight, let us march through Spain and take British Gibraltar. And Franco consistently said no, which in Spanish is no, because um, he says Spain is tapped out. After three years of civil war, um, we couldn't fight our way out of a wet paper bag. And Hitler and Mussolini, though they're frustrated by this, back off and accept this. At the end of World War II, there are people in the West that want to bring Franco to justice, as they call it, as a pro-Nazi uh, war criminal. But <clears throat> Franco is not. Franco remains the leader of Spain until his death in 1975, and uh, 74 or 75. Uh, and Franco oversees um, the introduction of Spain into uh, NATO in the late 1950s. Franco is rehabilitated, and Franco sets up a system whereby when he dies, King Juan Carlos of the House of Bourbon will set up and restore a Spanish Republic. And uh, after the early 19... Uh, this Republic was established between the mid-70s and the mid-80s, and it is still in, in charge. Um, so there's the story of Spain. Any questions before we move into Deutschland? Okay. Germany under Hitler, actually even before Hitler, is not going to obey the, the spirit of the Versailles Treaty when it comes to rearmament. The idea of being effectively disarmed on the same continent as the Bolsheviks is suicide. So, one of the first things that Germany does is it makes a deal with those very same Soviets. See, the Germans are the bad boys of Europe because they lost the war. The Soviets are the bad boys of Europe because they're communists. Both of them are basically treated like pariah nations by the League of Powers and by the West. So they come together. And an agreement is made between Russia and Germany to allow German troops to sneak across Poland or whatever to the Soviet Union and go deep into the vast spaces of Soviet Russia and train with the Red Army. The Germans bring their technical expertise. They bring some inventions. Uh, the Soviets, in addition to hosting all of this, bring theirs. And Germany, Weimar Germany and Soviet Russia end up strengthening each other's militaries in a secret alliance throughout the 1920s. <sighs> also, the 100,000-man limit is uh, negated through systems of reserve, much like was done in the time of Napoleon, where you basically bring troops in, train them up, and then put them in the reserves so that more troops can come in. And this way, you actually had far more men of, who were militarily trained in Germany than the treaty would otherwise allow. And Germany is forbidden to have an air force. So, glider enthusiast societies pop up all over Germany. And uh, learning how to fly a glider <clears throat> is actually more difficult than learning how to fly a powered aircraft. The key to staying aloft in a heavier-than-air craft is to have a certain critical mass of air passing over and under the wings. If you do that, the lift of the wings works and, and you fly. If you have an engine or engines that work, well, if, if, if you don't have enough air going over the wings, you can accelerate. And the engine speeds up, whether it's a propeller or later a jet, 
you increase your you increase your flight characteristics. In a glider, you can't do that. In a glider, what you have to do is find a way to make sure that you are engaged in controlled dives and swoops that will keep enough air flowing around the airfoils to give you lift. And then you've got to find a way to come in. It's a lot like the difference between <clears throat> getting on Lake Coeur d'Alene on a jet ski or in a motorboat as opposed to getting on Coeur Lake Coeur d'Alene in a sailboat. If you're in a sailboat, you have to learn how to read the wind. It's a much more delicate process. I've only sailed a few times in my life. It's kind of fun. I love boats. And uh, it, it's just, it's a totally different experience when you have an engine as opposed to when you don't. And of course, paddling that's, or, or rowing. That's a, that's a third type of boating. Uh, we don't have that in aircraft, though. You don't have men in aircraft actually <laughs> staying aloft like uh, with wings. So these glider societies are going to train up a new generation of pilots. And suddenly, when the Luftwaffe is reannounced by Hitler uh, in the early 1930s, uh, there are just tens of thousands of pilots ready to go uh, into the planes that Hitler was secretly building behind the scenes. Now, when Hitler comes to power, he shreds the rearm of the, uh, the, the disarmament clauses of Versailles, so Germany's army can increase in size. In size, uh, in I think 1934, he uh, unveils the Luftwaffe uh, at a military parade. Suddenly, there are biplanes wearing flying the swastika in a swastika formation, flying over the parade ground. Uh, we have an air force, Yay! and uh, the German air force in Hitler's time is called Luftwaffe, which literally means Luftwaffe Air Force. Um, Hitler's afraid at first of Britain and its Royal Navy. So Hitler makes a deal with the Royal Navy based on the Washington Naval uh, Disarmament Agreement called the Anglo-German Naval Agreement. And the Anglo-German Naval Agreement is where Britain agrees that the Versailles restrictions on building submarines and, battle and modern battleships uh, are gone, and Germany can build a navy again. So Hitler gets Britain to undermine the Versailles Treaty where it comes to the Kriegsmarine, which is Hitler's era German Navy. But of course, <clears throat> the thing about totalitarian dictators that you need to understand is they're liars. They, they don't keep agreements ever. <laughs> and therefore, what Hitler is building is not the limited agreement Navy that he promised, but uh, an unlimited Navy uh, based on what uh, their leading admiral, Eric Rader, called Plan Z, or Plan Z, if you want to be Canadian about it. Plan Z is uh, basically a new Kaiser-type high seas fleet with modern 1940s designs. One example of German duplicity in the naval field is that uh, the limit on battleships is 35,000 tons. When Germany builds its first real battleships uh, as part of the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, they claim that uh, the Bismarck and the Tirpitz, which are the first two ships, are 35,000 ton vessels. They're almost 50,000 tons, and the additional tonnage is almost all armor. Uh, the Bismarck and the Tirpitz as individual ships are much more powerful because they have this additional weight, mass, armor, scope than their British equivalents. So, Hitler is rearming. Versailles is being ripped up. France is upset because they're stuck on the continent right next to Germany, but the British are like, Versailles went too far anyway. Oh, we've got to let Germany spread its wings. So the British allow it. And the French can't do anything without the British. Now we come to 1936. Hitler observes the League of Nations and the Western democracies and, and their impotence in handling Mussolini and Ethiopia. So, here's a region of Germany that I haven't indicated on the map before, but I probably should have. 
And I'll use green. Okay. This is the Rhineland. It's the area of Germany west of, south of, Rhine River. As a, uh, I might as well throw the Ruhr in too because I make references to that. The Ruhr is up here, just beyond the Rhine. So, the Rhineland, according to the Versailles Treaty, is to be permanently demilitarized. That means no German military formations, no German fortifications, no German army bases, no, no, no. However, with the League and the British and the French being what Hitler would call spineless jellyfish, actually he, 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 he would later call the British Prime Minister a worm, um, Hitler marches his troops into the Rhineland. His generals are losing it because the German army, the Wehrmacht in Hitler's time, is not ready to fight the largest army in Europe, which is France, it's west, of, west of the Soviet Union. In any way, in 1936, the German military is just beginning to rearm. That's like having a, you know, a, a, a badger or a weasel break into your house and sending your two-year-old after it. It's not a good idea for the two-year-old. Unless you really don't like him. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we have like a little dog, Alan, right? Mm -hmm. He's small. My yeah. brother's not small, and he's four. Yeah. Very tall. And lately, he's been liking to pull Alan's legs and put him in a ball. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> and like, mm. like bend him in ways he's not supposed to bend. There's going to come a point where the dog will bite your brother. Yeah, well, he, Alan's just kind of like, he he loved, well, no, he, this is the human puppy, and he's got to love the human puppy because that's what dogs are programmed yeah. to do. But there comes a point where a dog won't accept physical abuse. Right. And <laughs> so that'll happen and just expect it. And then, he'll, and then Roman will know not to bend Alan. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, hopefully also people are telling Roman not to bend Alan. We, we don't let him near Alan if Good. he can. Good, Sometimes he Good. takes him out of the Yeah, well, the, the four-year-old, I, I get it. Yeah. Um... The only way the generals agree to obey Hitler's command, even though they took a personal oath of loyalty to him, is if there is a set of orders that say, the moment we hear that the French are marching into the Rhineland from the west, we're out of here. We turn around and we go back home. So this is one giant bluff. The Germans are like, yeah, going back to the Rhineland. <laughs> That's what they're ready to do. <laughs> now, what the anti-Hitler German officers, and there are a bunch of them, and the anti-Nazi Germans in society hope, oh, Hitler, he's gone too far. You know, tearing up the armament, rearmament clause, uh, disarmament clauses, that's one thing. He's marching troops up to the French border. They're not going to ever allow that. They're going to stand up, and Hitler's going to get crushed, and, and he's going to be overthrown. It's going to be great. So the German army marches into the Rhineland, and the French do nothing. Why? They do nothing because they don't want to have a war, because they're afraid of the trenches, because they're divided, because the, the French right wing that's somewhat pro-Nazi Oh, they're just taking their country back. The British say, oh, they're just taking their country back. So the French do nothing. And granted, the French did look at the British, and the British said, we're not doing anything. So without the British, the French aren't going to do anything. So all those uh, orders to, to run away if the French show up are useless. Hitler seems to be prescient. He seems to have the ability to pull things over on his enemies. And... The anti-Nazis within the German army and within German society are... What? Why didn't you do anything, France? No idea. They're apoplectic. And they're also reduced because success is contagious. 
and Hitler has succeeded. He, he, he restored German honor. So a number of people who are on the fence about being anti-Nazi are no longer. They're, 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 they're pro-Nazi. Well, there's 1936. Two years pass. Actually, in 1936 also, Austrian Nazis who, who worked for Hitler assassinate Austrian Chancellor Dolfus. Austrian Chancellor Dolfus <laughs> is a thug, but he's an anti-Nazi thug. So the Austrian Nazis who work for Hitler assassinate the Austrian Prime Minister, the Austrian Premier. This is obviously an attempt by Hitler to take over Austria. But this is still the Mussolini that's anti-Nazi. And Mussolini says, if Germany marches into Austria, Italy will march across the Brenner Pass. The stress of front, the anti-Nazi front led by Italy, will drive the Germans back into their own country and hurt them, punish them. Rome will once again beat Germania. Hitler in 1936 knows he can't defeat the Aitais. So um, he doesn't, he pulls back. The Austrian Nazis back off, and the Austrian government uh, continues to function like a republic, and a new prime minister named Schuslik, uh is, is appointed. For two years, until 1938. In 1938, <clears throat> Hitler begins beating the drums. Austria is German. Germany should be united. All Germans everywhere are part of Germany. By the way, communist China today echoes this. They claim ownership, control, and the primary allegiance of everyone of Chinese heritage wherever they are in the world, however long they've been there. So you could be a Chinese American who's been here since the 1860s, and uh, the People's Republic of China thinks that they control you. Well, Germany is making the same claim. If you're German, you're ours. Um, they have some... National self-determination should have included Austria, but it didn't. So a lot of people in the Western world, particularly in Britain, say it should have been. If you are going to unify nation states, Austria and Germany are the same culture. They're the same ethnic group. They're the same language. Yeah, there's North and South, but no more different than Western and Eastern Germany have different, slightly different German dialects. So the British theoretically are on board with it. The question is, and the French will do whatever the British do. What will Mussolini do? WWMD. <laughs> Sounds like weapon, weapon of mass destruction. What would Mussolini do? Well, Hitler decides to go for it. And he sends Germany's army into Austria. And sees, waits to see what happens. Well, the Austrian army does not fight. Austrian Nazis take control in Vienna. And two days later, Hitler has a parade through Vienna where the people who are pro-Nazi welcome him. The Von Trapp family has escaped over the mountains, if you've ever seen The Sound of Music. That's a fiction reference. Um, and Mussolini, at the height of the crisis, lets it be known, he'll let Hitler have this. And Hitler swears a personal bond of loyalty that he will not break. And when Mussolini's fate is uncertain, Hitler will come to his rescue on more than one occasion. And it's largely because... If Mussolini had stood up to Hitler in 1938, Hitler probably would have fallen. So this is early 1938. It's called the Anschluss of Austria. And now we come to the fulcrum. The fulcrum event that leads us to appeasement and World War II, the ultimate apotheosis, apotheosis element of appeasement happens in later 1938, September of. Here's the nation of Czechoslovakia. This green-shaded area is called the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland are, is a mountainous region that has a strong German minority or a slight German majority. 
Now, the Czech lands used to be part of the Holy Roman Empire. So you have Czechs, which are a subset of Slavs, and you have Germans and you have others co-mingling because the Holy Roman Empire is a multinational, multi-ethnic empire. The borders of the Czech lands, Bohemia and Moravia, always included the Sudetenland. But it was part of the Holy Roman Empire and then the Austrian Empire and then the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When Czechoslovakia becomes independent, it is the land of the Czechs and of the Slovaks. So this nationalistic idea becomes more in play. A, a, a Sudeten Nazi named Heinlein begins making trouble, saying that the Czechs are abusing us. The Czechs are raping our women. The Czechs are stealing our property. The Czechs are smacking around our children. The Czechs are treating us like scum. If we were part of Germany, they wouldn't. If we were part of Germany, they'd leave us alone. We need to be part of Germany. Make the Sudetenland part of Germany. Hitler takes up this call. And he begins demanding the Sudetenland. Now, these mountains that separate the Germans from the Czechs are the Bohemian Mountains, the Ore Mountains, the Sudeten Mountains. This is a mountainous frontier that the Czechs have very, very, very heavily fortified. The Czech military has the most advanced light machine gun in the world. The British will later call it the Bren gun. The Czech military has a very good medium tank. The Czech military is probably qualitatively at least as good as the German military in 1938. And the Czechs have an ironclad, ironclad defense agreement with France. Anything happens to the Czechs, France is obligated legally and morally to go to war to defend Czechoslovakia. So, when Hitler starts demanding the Sudetenland, the Czechs very confidently, under their president, Eduard Benisch, say, no, we're not doing it. Hitler begins to bang the dram drums of war even louder. You don't give us the Sudetenland, we will take them by force. Benisch says, we don't want war, but if you need to, come at me, in so many words. The French are obligated. The Soviets say, if Poland will let us march troops across Poland into Czechoslovakia, we will help you. <laughs> Benish, the Czech president, is rightly suspicious of this. Accepting help from the communist Russians is not a good idea. That's like, um, well, let's see. You are a, a hamster, and you're being menaced by um, a, a, an eagle. Eagle wants to eat you. You're diving. And you ask for a house cat to come in and protect you. Think about that. The Soviet Union does not send troops anywhere that it then pulls its troops out of. There's one occasion in their entire history where they do that. That's Austria after World War II. Otherwise, when the Reds come, they stay. So the Russians are willing to fight the Nazis, but the Poles and the Czechs, rightly, are, are suspicious of letting Russian troops into their country. Still, the Czechs have a fast, uh, a mountain fastness uh, for, for a border. They have a good army. They have good equipment. They have an ironclad defense agreement with France. Britain has an agreement with France. If France goes to war, Britain probably will too. And that means that if Germany goes after the Czechs, Germany will be at war with Czechoslovakia, France, Britain, Russia, and possibly Poland. Not a good moment for Hitler. But then, the good intentions of a well-meaning fellow, Neville Chamberlain, British Prime Minister is going to change all of this. And we will talk about this on Monday. Monday. Tomorrow I will not be here. You are going to have a substitute teacher. Don't ask who. You will bring work so that you can do productive work tomorrow. Any questions, comments, or thoughts?
Yeah. Is it John Johnson? That's a good question. Yes. Yeah. You'll find out on Monday. I am. It's called Leaving You on a Cliffhanger. So I've got to uh, bring this up. I want to hear. I Yes. And thank you very much. Have a good day.